Greetings and welcome to the Helen of Troy Second Quarter Fiscal 2021 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are on a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. If you do need operator assistance at any time during the event, please press star 0 on your telephone keypad. It is now my pleasure to introduce your host, Mr. Jack Jansen, Senior Vice President of Corporate Business Development. Thank you, sir. Please go ahead. Thank you, Operator. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Helena Troy's Second Quarter Fiscal Year 21 Earnings Conference Call. The agenda for the call this morning is as follows. I will begin with a brief discussion of forward-looking statements. Mr. Julian Minenberg, the company's CEO, will comment on some high-level results for the quarter, discuss current business trends. Then, Mr. Brian Grass, the company's CFO, will review the financials in more detail and reflect on considerations from the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic uncertainty as fiscal year 21 progresses. Both Julian and Brian will speak to you about our announced leadership plans. Following this, we will open the call to take your questions. This conference call may contain certain forward-looking statements that are based on management's current expectation with respect to future events or financial performance. Generally, the words anticipates, believes, expects, and other words similar are words identifying forward-looking statements. Forward-looking statements are subject to a number of risks and uncertainties that could cause anticipated results to differ materially from the actual results. This conference call may also include information that may be considered non-GAAP financial information. These non-GAAP measures are not an alternative to GAAP financial information and may be calculated differently than the non-GAAP financial information disclosed by other companies. The company cautions listeners not to place undue reliance on forward-looking statements or non-GAAP information. Before I turn the call over to Mr. Minenberg, I would like to inform all interested parties that a copy of today's earnings release has been posted to the Investor Relations section of the company's website at www.helenoftroy.com. The earnings release contains tables that reconcile non-GAAP financial measures to their corresponding GAAP-based measures. The release can be obtained by selecting the Investor Relations tab on the company's homepage and then the News tab. I will now turn the conference call over to Mr. Minenberg. Thank you, Jack. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I hope you and your families are staying safe and healthy. We recognize that people around the world continue to suffer as the virus and natural disasters take their toll. We extend our deepest sympathy to those who have lost loved ones to COVID-19, have been ill with the virus, have faced financial hardship, or are dealing with the devastating impact of hurricanes or wildfires. Turning to our earnings, Helen of Troy posted outstanding results this morning as our diversified portfolio continues to perform very well. We have been able to successfully adapt to and navigate through countless COVID-related challenges. From the start of this pandemic, we took decisive action to lead our business and organization through uncharted waters. We had two goals in mind. Our first was to safeguard employee health while continuing to provide our consumers and customers with the high level of service they have become accustomed to. Our second goal has been to adapt to the new normals with the speed and agility needed to stay focused on delivering business results for the here and now, while also advancing our multi-year phase two strategic plan for sustained long-term results. We remain laser focused on those goals and on our phase two transformation targets. We began leaning back into our key phase two priorities in the second quarter. The continued strength of the business now puts us in a position to do so even further in the back half of our fiscal year. We believe these investments will continue to benefit all stakeholders as we drive our value creation flywheel. The results we are reporting today would not be possible without the tremendous commitment of our exceptional people. The dedication of the essential frontline workers in our distribution centers, in our test labs, in our, and in our operational hubs around the world continue to make the difference every single day. All around the world, our associates are delivering elevated throughput to meet as much demand as possible in the challenging conditions from COVID and its ripple effects around the world. 
I am very proud to see how Helen of Troy's people in all parts of our business have embraced the shared sacrifice we asked of them during the early months of this crisis to preserve the organization and capabilities we all worked so hard to build in the transformation. Their trust and their hard work continue to pay off as the resilience of our business, organization, and culture gets tested and confirmed. As a result, in early July, we shared that we would restore all wages, salaries, and director compensation to pre-COVID levels effective August 1st. I am pleased to share that later in the second quarter, we also made our people whole on all back pay resulting from the temporary wage and salary reductions. We believe this is core to our values and highly consistent with our stated strategic goal to attract, retain, unify, and train the very best people. It's also simply the right thing to do. With regard to the status of our offices and our work from home arrangements, we expect to continue our current mix of essential workers operating our distribution centers and keeping many of our international offices open, such as those in Europe and Asia, while other Helen of Troy associates will most likely continue to work from home through the end of this fiscal year. We will continue to closely monitor the ever-changing COVID-19 situation to make sure our approach to facilities and work environments stays timely, thoughtful, carefully measured, and complies with expert guidance and local regulations. Before I discuss our business results further, I would like to touch on the two executive leadership announcements highlighted in today's press release. Helen of Troy's Board of Directors has asked me to extend my service as Helen of Troy's CEO beyond the February 28, 2023 end date in my current employment agreement. I am honored by their continued faith in me and enthusiastic about serving an additional year. I believe there is considerable opportunity ahead for continued growth of our revenues, profitability, brand portfolio, our global footprint, and our capabilities. When the amended employment agreement is finalized, we will make a formal announcement. I feel very fortunate to have had the opportunity to lead the company not only through the remaining three and a half years of phase two of our transformation plan, but also to provide continuity of leadership through all 10 years of transformation. I am right where I enjoy being, at the heart of our strategic thinking with a special responsibility to further reinvent our business, deliver sustained performance, and continue building organizational and cultural excellence. I look forward to stewarding the company through the end of fiscal 24 and through smooth succession planning for the next gener of generation of leaders for fiscal 25 and beyond. The second executive management announcement we made today is that our friend, colleague, and chief financial officer, Brian Grass, intends to retire a little over a year from now, effective November 1st, 2021. Brian is a valued partner to me and to our global leadership team. I greatly appreciate his expertise, integrity, high standards, and countless contributions during what will be more than a 15-year career at Helen of Troy. He has been influential in helping advance our transformation into a company that is built to last. Brian is rightfully proud of what he and the company have achieved, as well as the considerable progress he and his team have accomplished raising the levels of excellence for our global corporate finance team and for many of our systems. He has also been highly focused on establishing a compelling bench of internal CFO succession talent that we intend to groom over the next year. We also intend to conduct a comprehensive external search to ensure we have the very best next CFO for Helen of Troy. We expect that person to provide the outstanding level of financial leadership we are accustomed to and to continue to deliver on our transformation. Brian will speak more about his plans to retire during his remarks. Over the next year, he will, con he will continue to remain fully in his role, providing highly effective executive management and financial governance, and will assist with a seamless transition when the time comes. Now on to our business results. Our diversified business model and portfolio served us well in the second quarter and drove an outstanding first half for fiscal 21. As highlighted in our press release, we continue to see strong uh, customer demand for our products across each of our three business segments globally. Net sales growth was 28.2%. Adjusted diluted EPS grew a robust 68.3%. That growth was broad-based, 
as all business segments and international grew at least 20% in the quarter. Margins expanded behind mix improvements, disciplined investment spending, and operating leverage within our business units and in our shared service platforms. Our leadership brands performed extremely well, growing 30.3%, including a 3.2 contribution from Drybar. Online sales grew 32% and represented approximately 24% of our total sales in the quarter as the pandemic continued to accelerate the consumer trend from bricks to clicks. The first half of this fiscal year marked an excellent start to the second year of phase two. First half net sales grew by 20.4%, powered by leadership brand growth of 23.3%. International sales were notable, growing double digit in the first half of the year. The major projects in EMEA and Asia Asia, under our phase two strategy to double down on international are performing ahead of internal expectations and creating attractive new investment opportunities to continue driving international growth. Sales to the online channel increased by 32% to represent approximately 26% of our total fiscal year-to-date sales. Adjusted diluted EPS increased by 46.5% in the first half, and we generated $186 million of operating cash flow. Combination of winning first half results and strong prospects for the business in the back half of this fiscal year allow us to restore even more of the major phase two investments originally planned for this year than what we communicated in our July call. We believe this will help power the long-term sustainability of our value creation flywheel. The additional spending allows us to make key hires and drive ahead on direct-to-consumer, customization, product innovation, and marketing. It also allows us to provide more marketing support for the distribution gains we have earned, further diversify our supply chain beyond China, and make investments to expand our supply capacity and our infrastructure. The infrastructure investments are especially important in these middle years of phase two as we expand our distribution and IT capabilities to keep up with what has been more than 30% growth since our original transformation began and to prepare us to handle our future growth prospects. We are also leaning into additional select marketing opportunities across our business and regional portfolio, such as Hydroflask, No Touch Thermometers, and in supporting our Volumizer franchise. Even with demand continuing to surge in health-related categories, we believe it is prudent to continue to manage our marketing spend in the back half given the biological uncertainty about the path of COVID and given the veracity of the current cold and flu season, as well as other unknowns around consumer demand. Our efforts to improve supply are working, yet are still unlikely to satisfy all of the current demand. Taken together, these uncertainties make us unable to give specific quantitative financial guidance at this time. Brian will provide some additional perspective on this in his remarks. Regarding current trends, we like what we see so far. September was another very strong month across nearly all parts of the business. Major trends in health-related products continue, especially as the indoor season begins in northern climates, as hybrid school models start up, and as the overall nesting trend continues. While those have been positive business drivers for us, we expect the torrid pace of revenue growth to moderate somewhat in the back half as we anniversary the very strong finish to our last fiscal year. Switching now to results for the second quarter in our business segments, we are extremely pleased with our performance in beauty delivering 23% organic sales growth, the highest we have seen in more than a decade. The dry bar acquisition contributed a further 12.1 percentage points to the segment's total sales growth of 34.6% in the quarter. The organic growth comes on top of the 9.3% organic sales growth in the same period last year, despite the current challenges around retailers who are grappling with stay-at-home recommendations and measured reopening of their brick-and-mortar stores. Testament to our innovation stream and the strength of the one-step volumizer franchise as it continues to generate generate rave customer reviews for an expanding distribution and grow its market share. Syndicated data shows that during the latest 52-week period, Helen of Troy further grew its number one market share position in the online channel for U.S. hair care appliances and continues to hold a significant lead. Syndicated data in brick and mortar shows that during the latest 52-week period, 
We also grew our number two share position in the market for U.S. retail appliances. Our first mover volumizer appliance innovations continue to be a major driver and are a key expansion focus for us even as competitive copycat products enter the market. Our Revlon and Hot Tools one-step volumizers have now earned more than 90,000 online consumer reviews with ratings of 4.5 stars and up, depending on the site, and considerable media attention, both in traditional vehicles and on social media platforms. Sales of our newest leadership brand, Drybar, were all incremental in the quarter. The beauty industry has been among the hardest hit by COVID, shutting down hair salons and slow, slowing reopenings and traffic at major retailers in the Prestige Channel and in other parts of retail brick and mortar. Despite this challenge, Drybar revenue improved sequentially each month of the second quarter as Drybar salons expanded their careful market-by-market -market reopening plans that prioritize the safety of its clients. By mid-September, dry bar salons had largely reopened for business, especially those outside of coastal cities, but remain impacted by COVID. Prestige retail faced similar challenges during the quarter, responding by accelerating the use of e-commerce, buy online and pick up in store or BOPIS, and curbside pickup as they gradually reopened more of their brick and mortar stores. For key customers like Ulta, Sephora, and Nordstrom, traffic remains a challenge, but we continue to see positive sequential purchase trends for stores that have reopened. With regard to our previously disclosed divestiture plan for the personal care business, the process is advancing, and we anticipate being able to share more progress when we report our earnings for the third quarter in January. Now turning to health and home, an outstanding performance. Momentum continued in the second quarter as the segment's simple mission was more relevant than ever. Be there when consumers need us most with trusted solutions for healthy living and peace of mind. Organic sales grew 33.1% as all four of our health and home leadership brands grew sharply in the quarter. Demand remains very strong for Vicks, Braun, Honeywell, and Pure products that address needs around temperature, humidity, water quality, and air quality. The trends in the second quarter were especially powerful. New COVID developments emerge almost every day. The Northern Hemisphere generally experienced a very hot and dry summer, and devastating wildfires continue to rage across large swaths of the Western United States. Beyond the immediate impact of these events on the business, we believe the heightened media attention on our categories and brands has had important positive short and long-term implications for category development and household penetration, especially as this attention comes at a time when consumers are focused on current events, on learning more about protecting health. Braun remains our most global brand and is seeing significantly elevated demand. All Braun thermometer types are very relevant today, but none more so than our no-touch or non-contact thermometers, which measure and record a person's temperature with clinical accuracy yet require no physical contact. The use of thermometers is changing from what was primarily a diagnostic tool to understand the severity of an illness and help to distinguish between a cold and the flu to now a pre-screening device recommended by experts for use in identifying the potential presence of a virus like COVID-19. Thermometers have become the first line of defense to help protect not only our loved ones in the home, but to now also monitor public health and safety in schools, restaurants, stores, work sites, institutions, and in transportation systems. Earlier this year, we shared that we began investing additional capital and human resources into expanding thermometer production capacity, including no touch and ear. On top of the increase in capacity we secured in the first quarter, further production increases helped us satisfy even more of the demand in the second quarter. We are also adding incremental supply that should be operational in the third quarter and yet more coming online in the fourth quarter. With this ramp up, we expect to be more than double our total pre-COVID capacity by the end of the year. This will much better match thermometer output to the ongoing pandemic and better handle our fourth quarter during which the cough, cold, and flu season traditionally peaks. Air purification has also been a very hot category. U.S. sales for our Honeywell air purifiers grew strongly during the quarter. 
The key drivers were increasing concerns around COVID, especially as indoor season approaches for many households, as well as institutions such as restaurants, schools, and universities. Our air purifier sales were further aided by heightened media attention, highlighting the potential health benefits of using an air purifier during the pandemic. We also saw an early start to the wildfire season this year. Multiple August blazes in the Western United States unfortunately stand out even among recent record-breaking fire seasons for their scale and their intensity. Declining air quality from wildfires can also compound concerns around COVID-19 as more people are confined to enclosed spaces and polluted air can create risk of airway damage and respiratory infection. The surge in air purifier demand has been much stronger than we expected, straining our supply chain. We have responded quickly with a 50% increase in air purifier supply becoming operational by the end of next month. Demand for water purification also continued in the quarter, underscored by two key trends. The first is from COVID-19, as many people who continue to shelter in place and work from home are seeking additional avenues to help protect themselves and their families. The second is that our pure products are benefiting from an increasing trend of single-use plastic bottle bans around the world as mindsets shift toward multiple, towards more sustainable purchase and usage habits. Propelled by these trends and increases in supply and in distribution, syndicated data shows that Pure's growth has outpaced the growth of the category, resulting in market share gains for Pure's U.S. devices and replacement filters in brick and mortar. Lastly, in health and home, we have seen continued strong demand for our VIX humidifier devices and vapo steam inhalants. These products are designed to ease breathing by helping relieve the common symptoms of cold, of cough, and congestion that can accompany a wide range of respiratory infections. According to syndicated data, our VIX inhalant and humidifier businesses grew market share in the U.S. brick and mortar market during the quarter. In housewares, second quarter sales increased by over 20%, even as we faced a particularly strong comparison in which the segment grew more than 22% in the same period last year. Both of our housewares leadership brands grew during the quarter. It is clear the pandemic is changing nearly everything in our daily lives, including the way consumers look at food. As people continue adapting to shelter-in-place guidelines, new habits are forming. Many who used to rely on eating outside the home are now getting reacquainted with their kitchens. Studies confirm that consumers, especially millennials, are experiencing the joy of cooking more while sheltering in place and experimenting with a wider variety of meal options. It is this time of experimentation and newfound fun that is also expanding their use of essential products and gadgets for cooking, baking, brewing, cleaning, storage, and organization. All of these are in the sweet spot for our outstanding OXO lineup that helps consumers transform their homes and kitchens into engaging, efficient spaces that make every day better every day. We are excited about the prospects for the brand as OXO benefits from these positive new habits and greater adoption by a new and younger demographic. This is positively compounded by follow-on sales OXO usually earns once a household is penetrated. OXO grew in brick and mortar online and internationally during the quarter as we gained distribution, launched new products, and benefited from very strong point of sale trends and store traffic at certain retailers. Bath, Food storage, coffee, measuring, and baking had particularly explosive growth. International sales for OXO were also an excellent source of growth, especially in EMEA and online. OXO's domestic online sales benefited from significant increases in direct-to-consumer as the trends from bricks to clicks continue. Dot-coms such as Amazon, OXO.com, and Target.com were also standouts. Market share gains were strong for OXO in the United States. Syndicated data shows that even as the U.S. housewares category has grown fast, OXO's dollar sales growth during the quarter has been roughly twice as fast. OXO's partnership with 1% for the Planet further aligns the brand with its consumer as it joins a global community of brands that reinforce their positive equity by giving back the equivalent of 1% of its sales to environmental nonprofits. Hydroflask returned to growth during the quarter, as more people returned to the outdoors and to key brick-and-mortar retailers, which slowly reopened. 
The brand overcame a particularly strong comparison in the same period last year and overcame this year's headwinds from closures and lower store traffic at key retailers. According to syndicated data, Hydroflat continued to sustain its number one U.S. market share position and its large lead over competitors in insulated hydration vessels. International sales for Hydro Flask grew very fast in the quarter. While retail stores were largely open by the end of the quarter, consumers continued to shop online where the brand delivered strong e-commerce and DTC sales. Hydro Flask's brick and mortar point of sale also began to improve as foot traffic started to reemerge in regions where consumers felt more comfortable leaving their homes. While it is likely COVID will persist for a longer time than any of us would like, we continue to like our prospects on Hydroflask as it remains highly relevant and wildly popular and with its on-trend positioning, products, distribution, and online presence. As I wrap up my comments, I would like to emphasize the focus we are placing on our phase two initiatives. They are the key to continuing to drive our value creation flywheel. Heading into the back half of fiscal 21, our port portfolio is demonstrating excellent momentum, allowing us to use our cash flow to continue selectively investing in phase two. Our balance sheet and financial position are very strong and capable of supporting accelerated investment. With our strong cash flow and low leverage, we are in a strong position to fund higher inventory levels, deploy capital toward a creative acquisition that adds more critical mass to that flywheel, and consider opportunistic share repurchases. While many challenges from COVID grab the headlines, we believe we are creating a company that is built to last and has proven its ability to create value for our stakeholders in a wide range of market environments. Focusing on delivering results for all stakeholders has been a hallmark of Helen of Troy throughout its transformation, and we are proud to continue that work. I will now turn the call over to Brian. Thank you, Julian. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I hope that you are safe and healthy. Our thoughts continue to be with the people who have been directly affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. We want to extend our appreciation for the efforts of first responders, healthcare providers, and essential workers, and for the efforts of our own associates that aren't able to work from home. I'm pleased to say that the rate of infection among our associates has been minimal. Our priority has been and continues to be their well-being during this unprecedented time. The impact of COVID-19 pandemic has significantly accelerated demand for our leadership brands, and I'm grateful that Helena Troy is in the position to continue to provide products that help individuals and families during this difficult time. As Julian highlighted, we delivered an exceptional quarter, reporting more than 20% growth across all three segments and strong operating margin expansion. Our profitability was buoyed by temporary expense reduction and deferral initiatives put in place earlier in the year due to the uncertainty of the pandemic's impact on economic activity. Based on our strong performance and a little more visibility with respect to COVID's impact on our business, we have now reversed many of the expense reduction initiatives, particularly personnel related actions and reactivated several key phase two investments. We remain below normalized levels of marketing spend for several reasons, which I will cover later in my remarks. On the whole, the business is showing sales strength that I have not seen in my 14 years at the company, which combined with an expanding gross profit margin and expense discipline resulted in adjusted diluted EPS growth of 68.3% in the second quarter. Our liquidity was another highlight, ending the quarter with 1.1 billion in liquidity including $148.4 million in cash and $955 million available on our $1.25 billion credit facility, and our liquidity has continued to improve into October. We generated $171 million of free cash flow in the first six months of the year, and we increased inventory by almost $100 million and made capital expenditure investments of $15.2 million to better satisfy the surges in, in demand we have seen and help mitigate any potential further COVID-19 disruption on our supply chain. As we noted in today's earnings release, we have deferred our outlook for fiscal 2021 at this time. We expect to return to our historical practice of providing an outlook once visibility improves. Now moving on to a more detailed review of the quarter. 
Consolidated net sales revenue was 530.9 million, a 28.2% increase over the prior year. Organic business net sales grew 25.7%, driven by very strong sales growth in all three business segments. As expected, we saw improving trends in the housewares and beauty segments, and second quarter demand in the health and home segment continued to drive growth consistent with the first quarter. This strength more than offset the adverse impact of COVID-19 related store closures and lower store traffic at certain retail customers during the quarter, which continued to adversely impact net sales primarily in our housewares and beauty segments. This includes retailers such as Dick's, REI, Bed Bath & Beyond, Specialty Outdoor, Specialty Kitchen, Department Stores, Ulta, Sally's, Dry Bar Salons, and Closeout Retailers, where same-store net sales were generally down due to either store closures early in the quarter or reductions in foot traffic as consumers continue to adjust their shopping behaviors and discretionary spending. Consolidated sales in the online channel grew approximately 32% year over year to comprise approximately 24% of our consolidated net sales in the second quarter. Sales from our leadership brands grew 30.3% in the quarter, which includes 3.2 percentage points of growth from Drybar. While Drybar sales improved sequentially from the first quarter of the fiscal year, its second quarter sales continued to be hindered by Drybar Salon and key customer store closures. Organic sales for our houseware segment increased 20.2%, which included growth for both the OXO and Hydroflask brands. This reflects higher demand for OXO products as consumers spent more time at home cooking, cleaning, organizing, and pantry loading in response to COVID-19, an increase in online sales for both OXO and Hydroflask, higher sales in the club channel, growth in international sales, and new product introductions. These factors were partially offset by the COVID-19 related impact of reduced store traffic and store closures at certain retail brick and mortar cu customers, mostly in the early part of the quarter. Health and home organic business net sales increased 33.1% due to consumer demand for healthcare and healthy living products in domestic and international markets in both brick and mortar and online channels due primarily to COVID-19 and demand driven by severe wildfire activity on the west coast of the United States. These factors were partially offset by declines in non-strategic categories. Beauty segment net sales grew 34.6% and organic sales increased 23%, driven primar primarily by strong demand for our one-step family of products, expanded distribution, and an increase in international sales. Drive our products can contributed net sales revenue of 10.5 million or 12.1% to segment net sales growth. These factors were partially offset by a sales decline in the legacy mass market personal care business, the impact of store closures earlier, early in the quarter and lower foot traffic at certain retailers, and the unfavorable impact of net foreign currency fluctuations of approximately 0.4 million or 0.5%. Consolidated gross profit margin expanded for to 43.4% compared to 43%. The 0.4 percentage point increase is primarily due to a favorable product mix within health and home and the organic beauty business, the favorable impact of the dry bar products acquisition, a favorable channel mix within the houseware segment, lower direct import sales, and lower air freight expense. These factors were partially offset by unfavorable product mix in the houseware segment and the unfavorable comparative impact of tariff exclusion refunds received in the prior year period. Consolidated SG&A was 24.7% of net sales compared to 29.8%. The 5.1 percentage point decrease is primarily due to the impact that higher overall sales had on operating leverage and cost reduction initiatives, including temporary personnel, advertising, and travel expense reductions due to the uncertainty of COVID-19. These factors were partially offset by higher performance-based annual incentive compensation, higher legal expense, and higher customer chargeback activity. An SG&E ratio of 24.7% is below our historical norm, due partially to the surge in revenue, but also due to cost reduction measures in place for a portion of the quarter 
and lower marketing spend due to supply and distribution capacity constraints in certain parts of the business, which I will discuss later in my remarks. Gap operating income was 99.3 million or 18.7% of net sales compared to 54.5 million or 13.2% of net sales in the same period last year. On an adjusted basis, consolidated operating margin was 20.4% compared to 15.9% in the same period last year. The 4.5 percentage point increase primarily reflects the favorable impact that higher overall sales had on operating leverage, a favorable product mix within health and home in the organic beauty business, a favorable channel mix within housewares, and cost reduction initiatives, including temporary personnel, advertising, and travel expense reductions due to the uncertainty of COVID-19. These factors were partially offset by an unfavorable product mix within the houseware segment, the unfavorable comparative impact of tariff exclusion refunds received in the prior year period, higher performance-based incentive compensation, higher legal expense, and higher freight and distribution expense. Housewares adjusted operating margin increased 1.3 percentage points to 23.7%, primarily reflecting the impact that higher overall sales had on operating leverage, a more favorable channel mix, and cost reduction initiatives, including temporary personnel, advertising, and travel expense reductions due to COVID-19. These factors were partially offset by a less favorable product mix, higher performance-based incentive compensation expense, higher freight and distribution expense to support strong demand and increased customer chargeback activity. Health and home adjusted operating margin increased 6.7 percentage points to 17.9%, primarily, primarily reflecting the impact that higher overall sales had on operating leverage, a more favorable product mix, and cost reduction initiatives due to COVID-19. These factors were partially offset by the unfavorable comparative impact of tariff exclusion refunds received in the prior year period and higher performance-based incentive compensation expense. Beauty adjusted operating margin increased 7.6 percentage points to 19.5%, primarily due to the impact that higher overall sales had on operating leverage, a more favorable product mix, lower air freight expense, and cost reduction initiatives due to COVID-19. These factors were partially offset by higher personnel expense related to the acquisition of dry bar products, higher performance-based incentive compensation expense, and increased legal expense. Moving on to taxes, income tax expense as a percentage of pre-tax income was 9.6% compared to income tax expense of 10.3%, primarily due to the benefits recognized from the transition of our Macau entity from offshore to onshore status partially offset by increases in liabilities related to uncertain tax positions. As you may recall, we currently have an indefinite tax holiday in Macau. The Macau offshore law and its supplementary regulations that grant tax in incentives to approved offshore institutions will be abolished on January 1st, 2021. Existing approved offshore institutions such as ours can continue to operate under the offshore regime until the end of calendar year 2020. Beginning in calendar year 2021, our Macau subsidiary will transition to onshore status and become subject to a statutory corporate income tax rate of approximately 12%. As previously disclosed, the impact of this change on our consolidated affected tax rate was subject to a transfer pricing analysis, which was completed in the second quarter. On an annual basis, we expect this change to increase our overall consolidated effective tax rate by 1.5 to 2 percentage points beginning in fiscal year 2022, which we consider to be a favorable outcome given the extent of the corporate tax rate change. Net income was 87.3 million or $3.43 per diluted share on 25.5 million shares outstanding compared to 46.1 million or $1.83 per diluted share in the prior year on 25.2 million shares outstanding. Non-GAAP adjusted income grew 69.7% to 95.9 million or $3.77 per diluted share compared to 56.5 million or $2.24 per diluted share. Now moving on to our financial position for the second quarter of fiscal 2021 
compared to the second quarter of fiscal 2020. Accounts receivable turnover was 68.7 days compared to 68.4 days for the same period last year. Our accounts receivable balance was 402 million compared to 310 million, 310.4 million in the same period last year. Inventory turnover was 3.3 times for the trailing 12 months ended August 31st, 2020 compared to 2.9 times for the prior year period. Inventory was 350.2 million compared to 370.9 million. Net cash provided by operating activities increased 148.1 million to 186.3 million for the first six months of fiscal 2021. The increase was primarily due to higher net income and higher cash provided by accounts payable and accrued expenses, partially offset by higher cash used for receivables and inventory. The increases in working capital components are in line with our expectations due to the significant growth this fiscal year and our efforts to mitigate any further potential COVID-19 disruption on our supply chain with higher inventory levels. We expect to further build inventory leading into our peak selling seasons in the second half of the year. Total short and long-term debt was 300.1 million compared to 301.2 million. Free cash flow for the first six months of fiscal 2021 increased 141.7 million to 171 million. As of the end of the second quarter, our leverage ratio as defined in our debt agreements was 0.9 times compared to 1.2 times at the same time last year. This is a sequential decrease compared to 1.1 times as of the end of the first quarter of this fiscal year. Our net leverage ratio, which nets our cash and cash equivalents with our outstanding debt, was 0.5 times at the end of the quarter. We continue to hold higher than normal levels of cash to protect us against any future exogenous shocks to the credit markets and allow us to fund our targeted inventory levels going into our peak selling seasons and through Chinese New Year without the need to incur further debt. We believe our liquidity and cash flow puts us in a great position to continue navigating the uncertainty of the external environment and take advantage of potential capital allocation opportunities. Now on to a business update. As we look to the remainder of the fiscal year, we are still operating in an extremely dynamic environment. Due to the evolving COVID-19 pandemic and related consumer and business uncertainty, we are not providing an outlook for fiscal 2021 at this time. In addition to the lack of visibility into consumer demand and the uncertain impact of COVID-19 on the retail environment, Trends are emerging that may impact our ability to fulfill some orders on a timely basis and our ability to make marketing investments with an acceptable return, all of which have a significant impact on our ability to forecast within a reasonable range. As previously disclosed during the first quarter of fiscal 2021, as part of a comprehensive approach to preserve our cash flow and adjust our cost structure to align to lower anticipated revenue, we implemented a number of temporary precautionary measures in response to the uncertainty from COVID-19. Based on stronger than expected performance, we reversed a number of these measures toward the end of the second quarter of fiscal 2021, including a restoration of all wages, salaries, and director compensation to pre-COVID-19 levels. In addition, towards the end of the second quarter, we also selectively increased levels of investments in certain marketing activities new product development and launches, and capital expenditures in support of our phase two transformation strategy. During the remainder of the fiscal year, we are planning to continue to increase our marketing and other growth investments. We continue to see very strong demand trends in many of our product categories. In the second quarter, demand continued to outpace even recently increased supply capacity with respect to thermometry, air filtration, water filtration, and various products within housewares, which in some cases is resulting in out of stocks. Surges in demand and shifts in shopping patterns related to COVID-19 have strained the US freight network, which is resulting in carrier delays. In addition to houseware sales growth of 14.1% and 22.4% in fiscal years 2019 and 2020 respectively, demand has further surged for the OXO brand, which in combination with carrier delays has caused order flow to outpace shipping capacity in one of our distribution centers. 
In some cases, this is resulting in out-of-stocks at retail for some OXO items. But we have moved very quickly to bring additional distribution and storage facilities online in support of surging order volume and higher targeted inventory holdings heading into our peak selling season. We believe there could continue to be some level of out of stocks in certain parts of our business. Not only do these trends impact our ability to accurately forecast revenue, they can also limit our ability to make marketing expenditures with an adequate return on investment. In certain categories, where macro trends like COVID-19 are driving demand significantly higher than historical levels, or in situations where supply or distribution is capacity constrained, we believe that driving additional demand through incremental marketing activities could compound potential ship shipment delays or out of stocks. In these situations, currently planned marketing investments designed to drive short-term demand would not be made. We believe these factors could contribute to a wide variation of outcomes with respect to our adjusted diluted EPS for the remainder of the year. Our base plan is to make the majority of the incremental marketing investments that we planned at the beginning of the year and that we believe are best for the long-term health of our brands. If we are able to execute against our base plan, we would expect adjusted operating margin for the full fiscal year to expand by approximately 0.2 to 0.4 percentage points compared to fiscal 2020, which would imply year-over-year -year compression in the second half of the year. If current de demand trends continue and we are not able to execute against our base plan, adjusted operating margin could expand by as much as 0.8 to 1.6 percentage points for the full fiscal year compared to fiscal 2020. As a result, we believe there is, could be as much as 50 cents to a dollar of adjusted diluted EPS variability just for marketing investments that are planned for the second half of the year, but may not be made due to an unacceptable return on investment, capacity constraints, or lack of visibility. This range does not include the additional potential revenue variability from COVID-19. While this year is certainly testing us all, I am pleased with how our entire organization is rising to the challenge. Our teams are working hard to fulfill customer and consumer orders while simultaneously executing the key phase two initiatives we have chosen in developing operational plans for a variety of scenarios. We remain disciplined yet opportunistic in our extensive and capital investment approach, focusing on maintaining a strong balance sheet to ensure we have the flexibility to pivot our approach as we navigate these uncertain times. Finally, just a few comments regarding the announcement of my intent to retire on November 1st, 2021, just over one year from now. As stated in today's earnings release, I've put aside my entrepreneurial interests for almost my entire career, and I've now reached a point where I can explore these interests in a financially responsible way while still being young enough to do it. It's my dream to build something that I could hand over to my son one day. I also want to be more available for my son than I would be if I continued in my current role. I believe I can be successful in different ways in my professional career, but the only way I can be successful as a dad is to be there. My wife has been nothing but patiently supportive despite the long hours, personal sacrifices, and intrusions on family time, but I owe her more. To use a financial analogy, I've made a lot of withdrawals from the family account, and it is time to start making some deposits. Finally, I've always tried to put the company's interests first, and I believe the company will benefit from a fresh set of eyes, new blood, and a different voice. I'm proud to say that the company has never been stronger financially, operationally, or strategically, and I believe the best is yet to come. I'm also proud that we have developed strong internal CFO succession talent, whom we will continue to groom over the next year. The company also intends to conduct an external search to ensure the best possible succession for Helen and Troy. I want to thank Julian for his friendship, mentorship, and trust. I also want to thank Julian, the board of directors, our global leadership team, and the finance organization for allowing me to be a part of this amazing journey. It is a gift to be entrusted with the responsibility of leading a company like Helen and Troy, and I am truly grateful. I look forward to working with Julian to ensure the smoothest possible transition for the company. I also look forward to speaking with many of you over the next year, hopefully in person at some point. And with that, I'd like to turn it back to the operator for questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the floor is now open for questions. 
If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad at this time. A confirmation tone will indicate that your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. Once again, that is star 1 to register questions at this time. Our first question today is coming from Bob Labeck of CJS Securities. Please go ahead. Good morning, and uh, congratulations on the personal news as well as the strong operating performance. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Great to hear from you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, you guys as well. Great. No, it's super exciting to hear, Julian, that you're extending your contract and staying on. And Brian, obviously, I'll admit a little bit of a surprise announcement, but uh, it sounds like you've thought about it a lot, and it sounds uh, terrific. So congratulations. Well, thanks. I'm going to miss uh, working with you for sure. And, you know, it's not goodbye now, so we have a little bit of time, but but I valued our uh, working together over the past, so I'll miss that. Oh, absolutely. No, I, I appreciate it very much as well, and I won't say goodbye yet either because we have another year. Um, maybe before just jumping uh, to the operational results, one more question for you, Brian, if you don't mind. Can you talk about your current, you know, ownership position in Helen and Troy and how that might, you know, change or be impacted if that's you know, thought of as part of the, you know, funding of your your future pursuits or, you know, how you're thinking about that? Sure. Uh, so I have a meaningful position in Helena Troy in terms of stock ownership. And, you know, I would expect that the takeaway is I would expect that to continue through my date of retirement. I do expect to have, you know, some uh, level of sales for uh, diversification purposes and retirement uh, planning purposes. But, but again, I expect my ownership to remain meaningful throughout my uh, tenure. It's also important to note that uh, per my uh, severance agreement and our retirement plan, I'm eligible for continued vesting of my stock awards. And so I'll have a vested interest in Helena Troy's success, the success, succession planning work that we're doing for years after my retirement because I have a vested interest in, in those stock awards that will vest uh, one, two, three years after uh, the date of my retirement. So uh, I think the, the key takeaway is I have a you know very, very meaningful uh, ownership interest in Helena Troy stock, and I don't expect that to change in a meaningful way, although there, there, there could be some uh, sales over time, just again for diversification and retirement planning. Okay, got it. Makes a lot of sense. And uh, as I said, we have another year, so I won't say goodbye. But uh, jumping over to operations or just the business in, in general, obviously you guys are a consumer-centric company uh, focusing on innovation and you know, new products, and that's what's been driving your growth for so long. How have the needs, the wants, or the desires of your customers changed from COVID? And how are you changing right now to address these needs and you know, being able to still get consumer insights in a you know, different environment. Yeah, thanks, Bob. It's a great question. Uh, Consumer-centric, that's exactly the right word for us. Uh, it is our single-minded uh, focus and, and, frankly, our obsession. Uh, in the case of uh, COVID-related demand, uh, consumers are, are doing some interesting things. Uh, as indoor season comes along in the Northern Hemisphere, so think uh, schools, universities, uh, less time outside in general, because of the temperature, uh, we're seeing a, a considerable surge in things like air purifiers. There's tons of articles in the press, uh, some in the scientific press, lots of recommendations now, even from the CDC, on the subject of indoor transmission, uh, ventilated spaces, uh, droplets, particles, et cetera. Uh, so this is a big deal, uh, and it is changing consumers' behavior. Uh, we're seeing a tremendous surge in air purifier sales uh, that's only accelerated uh, since Q2, so here we are in almost the middle of Q3, and I can definitely say that that is um, uh, growing considerably. We're bringing tons more capacity online, uh, as was said in the public remarks. Uh, in fact, about 50% more air purifiers on top of what we've already sold and have uh, coming by the end of uh, next month into our uh, production system. Uh, and in the case of thermometers, there's a change as well. Uh, here we're seeing people going from this idea of uh, detecting temperature to now screening. Uh, and that's happening both on the consumer or household side and also in institutions of all kinds. So thermometers, uh, you may have seen it 
uh, yourself. I recently went to a Apple store and with people six feet apart online, uh, the first thing they do is, is check your temperature. Um, importantly, with no contact thermometers, which has become a big, uh, a big skew for us. And uh, we're making a lot more of those as well in our production increases. Lastly, on consumer behavior, uh, the nesting thing uh, has been a really big deal in housewares. And this is good news for the company as well. Uh, we're seeing, for example, uh, younger people, millennials and even younger households than that now, um, discovering uh, sort of joys of home, joy of cooking, uh, tooling up, gadgeting up. And I think everyone on this call probably knows that OXO has a very positive uh, rabbit-like quality, meaning once, once or two, one or two um, OXO items make it into the home, uh, their quality, their excellence, the feel, consumer experience, what we call the second moment of truth. Uh, after you buy it, you use it, that second moment uh, makes those rabbits multiply considerably within the house and, and you go back a year or two later, it's kind of like hydroplast. You'll, you'll just see a lot of them uh, scattered around the house. So that's uh, a couple of examples of consumer habit changes. I'll give you one last one, uh, which is around dry bar. Uh, there's quite a lot of uh, dry bar um, home uh, care happening. So think of women home more. Uh, fewer trips to the salon, but nonetheless on Zoom calls and all their other obligations and uh, want to look good and dry bar products are just spectacular for that. People are buying them, especially online. Okay, great. Um, appreciate all that color there. And you've talked about it you know, a number of times on the call today. Obviously, you're selling products as fast and sometimes you know, can't even sell as many you're making as you're selling this fast, you can make them, and you've pulled back on marketing to not exacerbate the supply constraints. Um, what is there other areas to spend? Are you, are you shifting your spending patterns? Um, what other projects can you spend on, and can you give us some examples of you know what you're doing with that marketing? Obviously, some of the marketing is you know flowing through the lack of marketing is flowing through to the bottom line, but are there other things you can be spending on internally? Yeah, uh, a ton. So, uh, and there may even be some confusion on this. Uh, so I want to make sure this gets out, but I'm really glad you bring it up. Uh, two, two things I'd like to say. Uh, one is uh, we are spending heavily on the phase two key initiatives and it's not just marketing. And the second is that uh, we are spending on marketing, especially in certain areas. We just don't want to stimulate short-term demand on products where we already have so much uh, natural demand that we can't meet the supply. So that's a, an ROI thing you already had uh, an overwhelming amount of orders and you can't meet every single one of them, to spend short-term money to generate more of those orders is, is not a good return on the investment. Uh, in the case of the other areas that we're spending, think of the things that were listed in the call. Um, infrastructure, that's IT, distribution throughput capability. Um, it's also the ability to diversify our supply chain beyond just China, which is something that many people on this call were uh, pounding the table for uh, only a few months ago, and we have been doing for some time. Uh, we're also uh, spending a fair amount of money on hiring, especially in key areas of the company. Think upstream, uh, especially engineering, quality, product development. We're spending on product development in a big way. And in marketing itself, there's things that don't hit the market in the very short term. So think of uh, content uh, for videos, packaging, um, new claims, development, testing, uh, new product, um, testing with consumers, market research, um, and uh, other areas as well as mentioned on the call. We're spending money also on uh, the topic of um, uh, culture, uh, especially now with new people coming on board, uh, training them uh, in a work from home environment it takes a little bit of extra cost because they don't have the natural uh, onboarding experience. So plenty of money going out the door, uh, and on the subject of uh, all of it against phase two flywheel uh, generators, and lastly on the marketing, uh, to be careful uh, not to spend to generate short-term demand uh, if we don't see enough supply. Hey Bob, I'd, I'd like to add something too. We're, we're taking advantage of this opportunity to spend a lot operationally as well. So we're expanding our distribution footprint. We're uh, you know, improving the quality of our systems and, and doing a lot of activities around that. I, I, and, and I really think the outcome's good either way. I, I think maybe there's focus on a little bit of compression in the back half, but I think, you know, if we have a little compression, even with that, we still get a very good outcome for the year. 
and we've been able to invest behind our brands. If we aren't able to uh, do the spending, then we're going to get a great, tremendous outcome in terms of earnings and I think still be in a, a very good spot with respect to demand trends and the health of the business. And we've made the investment operationally that will support the growth for the future. So I, I kind of view the situation we're in as being, you know, no lose. It's just a little bit fluid. And so when people want uh, very precise financial uh, projections, it's hard to give, but it's not a bad outcome either way. Um, it's either going to be a very strong uh, profit result or it'll be a good profit result with investment behind our brand and investment behind the infrastructure of our business. So, you know, I view it as, you know, can't lose in the situation. It's just a wide range of outcomes that we could have for the full year. And we want to be very transparent about that. And that's what we're trying to do. Okay, great. No, that, that sounds terrific. And then last one, I promise I'll, I'll, I'll jump back in queue. But, um, you know, typically you know, back to school has been pretty uh, big for Hydroflask. So I was kind of curious, this year's obviously massively different than any other time. And one kind of update on that, how that may, have, may or may not be impacting Hydroflask. And then I can't help myself. So I also want to ask about, you know, potential customization, you know, enhancements to the Hydroflask opportunity and, and kind of where that stands. Yeah, let's start with Hydroflask. Um, just tons of opportunity on Hydroflask. Uh, we've spent years building that franchise. We're doing a ton more of it right now. Uh, we use the word leaning in a couple of times in our uh, comments, and, and we mean it. Uh, there's some key brands that we said we are investing heavily in. Uh, we also said that short term there are marketing opportunities. Hydroflask is very much one of them, in fact, um, almost on the top of the list. Uh, we're spending also, by the way, on our Volumizer franchise, which is growing rapidly uh, and expanding around the world. We're spending on international. Uh, we're spending on those no-contact thermometers, especially in Asia, as, as examples. And on Hydroflask, uh, the build-out is a big deal. Um, it, it's doing extremely well in, in most of its markets, especially outside of the United States right now, happens to be on fire. Uh, and on DTC is a huge new driver for Hydroflask beyond what we've done already one where we feel we can catch up uh, considerably with what's going on in the market and where we're pouring a ton of investment. Okay, super. Well, I will uh, jump back in and, and pass the questions on. Thank you. Thanks. A pleasure. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Rupesh Parith of Oppenheimer. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thanks for taking my question. And also congrats on a, on a nice quarter. Um, so I, I guess I want to start out with just, just – just a question on guidance. So we look at your commentary. It, it suggests that um, either we could see expansion of 20 to 40 basis points if you enjoy your spending plans or 80 to 60 base, 80 to 160 basis point if you can. Uh, so at least based on my estimate, that implies operating margins could be down more than 200 basis points in the back half of the year. Is that is that accurate? And then is there any way to, I guess, think about, you know, what, you know, that, you know, whether these investments, um, accelerated investments maybe that you would have made in future years and you just pulled them forward to this year? So I, I think it's close, directionally accurate. I mean, you, I, I didn't calculate the back half, but I think if you do the math of, of what we've given you, you can you get the outcome. So it's really just math what happens in the, the back half, and that's you know really not our focus. Our focus is the outcome for the year and the health of the business going forward, and that's what we're uh, striving towards. The quarterly variability, I think, is is not worth. Uh, spending much uh, time on because, um, you know, it doesn't matter at the end of the day how we get there. It just matters, you know, where we get. And we want to be careful with the, the health of the business, and, and we're focused on that. But like I said previously to Bob, either outcome is very positive in our minds. Either we've used the opportunity that we've been given to invest behind the brand, and we're in a very strong position going into next year, and we, we have a little bit of compression in the back half of the year, or we don't have the compression. We have an incredible result for the full fiscal year, and we're, we're still positioned, we believe, to do well going forward, but we, we are very conscious and aware of the health of our brands, and, and so we're, we want to use every opportunity that we've been given with the demand surge to invest behind our brands. It's just the demand surge has been so great that we have to be a little more selective in terms of our marketing spend because we can't drive demand where we can't fulfill 
uh, meet the needs of the demand. And so it's a very unique uh, situation to be in and a good situation to be in. And, and we're figuring it out. Uh, and I think we're stewarding the brands and the business as well as we possibly can, given all the volatility. So I, I hope that answers your question. I know it's more specific about the, the precise compression. I, I, I think that's something to consider and know as you're doing the math of our projections, but I don't think it should be the takeaway. The takeaway should be we're, we're stewarding the health of our business uh, the best we can in this environment, and I think we're in a very good place. Okay, great. That, that, that's helpful, Color there. Um, then, and then maybe just one follow-up question. So as we look at the health and home business, you know, obviously very strong growth in, in Q2. Um, I was just curious if you could speak to sell-in versus sell-out, if you saw any restock benefit during the quarter as maybe some, some of your retailers ordered ahead of the key season? Yeah, it's, it's mostly sell in and, and sell out. Demand is extremely strong, especially in four leadership brands that make up the vast majority of health and home. So just to be clear, that's VIX, Braun, Honeywell, and Pure. And um, people may have the wrong impression. They, they may think that somehow we, we don't have supply. It, it's not true. Uh, we have large amounts of supply. We've made them bigger, and they're going to get bigger still. What is true is that we have even larger amounts of demand, uh, especially in um, the air purifiers and the thermometers. And so what's happening is the sell-in is, is quick, sorry, the uh, well, inbound is quickly the outbound. And for retailers, uh, what's uh, ordered is quickly sold through. That is leading to some out of stocks, and that's why we called it out. You can probably see those in the marketplace. In the case of uh, the replenishment orders, they're constant, uh, and we're fulfilling as much of those as we humanly can. There is some allocation uh, just because of the limited supply, and the up goes less and less of that. And then in terms of the replenishment for the cold and flu season, um, retailers are properly um, uh, positioned, I believe, for uh, a normal cold and flu season. Um, there is uncertainty, and we called it out in our remarks about what that season will be like for the simple reason uh, that COVID is unusual and concurrent. So we'll see how that goes, but uh, everything's in the right place. And the more that we bring in, uh, it all sells through, and, and that's happening for retailers too, and they're replenishing as fast as they can. Okay, great. Thank you very much for all the color, and best of luck for the balance of the year. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, let me follow up a little bit on the compression uh, in the second mm -hmm. half. I mean, you're pointing out, I think, that it seems like a big number. I, I want to point out that in the, the profitability in the back half of last year was very strong, too. And, and, very, and we had a very strong demand surge or volume surge, especially in Q4, which was a little bit ahead of our expectations. And so the profit was also ahead of our expectations. And we, we you know, didn't have the spending line, lined up to go along with that uh, outcome. So... It, hopefully a little bit of color there and you understand that the comparison is important as well and that will factor into the compression. But like I said, I, I think either way, uh, the, the outcome is good for the full year and quite honestly, even the second half, because I think we'll be positioning ourselves well for, for next year. Yeah, it, it, may, it may be time to just get real clear on this uh, compression thing, because I think it's coming up a fair amount, and, and it's possible that people are having a concern that, that is greater than, than the situation that we're really in. Um, think, think of the year as a lumpy one. Uh, we were in a situation like everyone else in the world where COVID hit hard in months like uh, March, April, May, and we, like others, uh, turned off uh, some light switches uh, and cut our spending. We, we had increases in margin because of that. As the demand surged, and we saw that in Q1 and now again in Q2, uh, we had margin expansion that's above a norm and, and not a sustainable regular number. As we look at our phase two investments that we originally envisioned at the beginning of the year, uh, they are bold and they are right. Uh, and those significant investments are what power the flywheel and is creating the long-term transformation that has, has generated so much value in this, uh, this stock. Uh, the result now is that the same management team uh, is doing the right thing. We are using the tremendous cash flow of the company that you saw, that $171 million of free cash flow in the first half, uh, to drive that engine in the back half. So if you've starved uh, the spending in the front half because of the lumpy uh, COVID thing and have opportunities both on infrastructure uh, as well as in the marketplace, hiring, uh, the other things I mentioned in the list I gave in the public remarks, um, uh, only a fool would not do that and spend into strength. 
uh, what you'll see, as Brian pointed out, uh, is a year that should have a tremendous outcome on top of the tremendous outcome we had last year. And the lumpiness in between is, is the truth of COVID. Uh, if we went and spent the rest of the year hiding under our beds and preserving that uh, very, very high unusual margin of the first half, uh, I think we'd be doing a tremendous disservice to the long-term trajectory of the business and to our shareholders. Okay, great. Thank you. I think that was that was helpful, Seller, to clear up some of the confusion. Yeah, sorry to be tough there, but I think people have this idea that um, you know short-termism is somehow a good idea. Um, we're, we're not only managing for the long haul, but I think of it this way. We, we plan in, I think, in five-year chunks. That's our strategy. We plan in three-year chunks. That's our um, strategic execution. And we deliver in one-year chunks. And for the last six years, uh, we've not only done that, but uh, delivered strongly. Uh, we don't think this year will be an exception, uh, but that lumpiness is unusual. It's COVID-driven, and we are doing the right thing. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Olivia Tong of Bank of America. Please go ahead. Great, thanks. Good morning. Um, I first want to talk a little bit about sales. Um, you talked about, you know, September kind of continuing the trend that you saw in the um, in the quarter, uh, in the August quarter. Um, can you just talk a little bit about the, whether uh, Q2 benefited from catching up to prior demand? Um, did the quarter benefit in any way from a pull forward of future sales, or have these trends kind of just net net, you know, sort of any impact from timing shifts. And then just also, you know, obviously realize that a number of your categories are benefiting from COVID uh, prevention, wildfire related demand, all these things. So can you talk to your expectations when, when we do get a vaccine and what, to, what implications that might have on sales? Thanks. Yeah, a couple of things uh, in there. So there's backward ones, current ones, and future ones. So let me try to unpack it that way. Um, start with the backward ones. Um, we did not see pull forward. What we see is a surge in demand uh, in Q1. We saw it again in Q2, and we saw an acceleration in Q2, uh, no, not only in demand, but in people's opportunity to buy in brick and mortar. As stores opened in Q2, we all saw that during months like June, uh, July, into August. Um, people were shopping, but frankly, at a lower rate. Uh, online continued to surge. That's the whole bricks to clicks thing and the, the fact that people are home a lot more, uh, so they're just in stores less. That's the traffic thing. So not pull forward, but sell through. Uh, in terms of the surges in demand, it's correct that COVID is driving surges in things like the health-related products, like the thermometers, air purifiers, water purifiers, et cetera. Uh, and in the case of uh, the future, uh, what we've seen so far in September is, is the same. It's just been very, very strong. We're in the early days of October, and uh, while we didn't say it in our uh, prepared remarks, I can say we're in a safe harbor here in a public call, uh, that October is also continuing to be excellent, uh, although we're in the early days of October. Uh, of course, we've reforecasted internally, and that forecast looks good. Uh, that said, there is a fog that comes with COVID. And to your point about the future, there are unknowns, and we tried to call that out in our prepared remarks and be responsible uh, about the truth of that uncertainty. So starting with the vaccine, uh, there's much talk about the vaccine, but there are three questions about it that nobody knows. Uh, when, how many, and how many will take it. So when will the vaccine come, how many uh, doses will be available, and how many people will take it after all, uh, not to mention how effective. I'm just assuming it will be effective. Um, those things are just not known, let, let alone the impact it may have on the cold and flu season, which, which people speculate about, but there's frankly no facts on the matter. So as we look at the future, uh, what we think is that sales will remain strong. As we said in our prepared remarks, um, the torrid growth of the first half will moderate a bit, but uh, people should hear the word growth. Uh, and remember, in the back half base, uh, there was significant growth in the back half base, and we see significant growth over that. So hopefully that gives you some color on the sales side, past, present, and future. Olivia, it's Brian. I just want to add that Julian mentioned store closures and, lo and lower foot traffic. I want to point out that we got the results for Q2 without even having a full quarter of either stores being open or operating at full kind of traffic with full traffic patterns. And that's still not going to continue for a while. I mean, we have some of our retailers that have same store sales down 50% year over year, yet we were still able to produce the result that we did for the second quarter. So you're kind of asking, did we accelerate anything into the second quarter? 
And, and the answer is no. In fact, I think the second quarter was dampened by the fact that we didn't have brick and mortar fully up and operating. Probably likely won't for some time, but I think our results have shown that we can be very successful in that environment. Great, thanks. Um, that's helpful. Um, a second question for me is just, and, and I apologize if it appears like I'm beating a dead horse, but it does seem like the market is, is clearly questioning the second half margin implications. So why shouldn't the year benefit more significantly from the sales leverage in the first half? I mean, are you adding more projects than you originally planned? If so, what are they? Because adding personnel back, um, you know, was that was part of the plan uh, pre-COVID, right? Yep. Sticking to yep. investments, that was the plan pre-COVID. So why isn't there more of a incremental um, margin expansion plan for the year just from the fact that sales are coming in significantly better than you thought? Yeah. Go ahead, Brian. Let me start, Olivia, and I think then Julian will add. Yes, we had plans pre-COVID, but we put those plans largely on the shelf for the first half of the year. So if you're now going to take something that was going to be spread over four quarters of a year, and now you're concentrating them into two quarters of a year, you, you will obviously have compression. I also think it's just not a right way to run a business to take a tailwind like we've seen from COVID and not use the opportunity to invest some of that uh, tailwind that we've received back into the business. We've always talked about our kind of algorithm of take, letting 50% of our unexpected uh, uh, profit improvements or expected and allowing that to drop to the bottom line and then reinvesting the other half of that. We're, we're taking the same approach now and we've got this uh, situation where we weren't able to make all the expenditures or chose not to make the expenditures in the first half of the year and we want to get back on track uh, uh, on a lot of that. So to me, it's very clear why the situation would, would occur with the numbers and the compression across the quarters. The, 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 we, our spending was very much dampened uh, by uh, the actions we were taking the first half of the year. I mean, you can see it in our SG&A uh, margin. And look back at the company historically, it's, we've never had a uh, SG&A ratio below 25%. So it's artificially low. We need to get a base of spending back. And yes, we are choosing to make more investments than we had even originally planned in terms of operations and infrastructure because we need to uh, keep up with the, the amazing growth that we've had, honestly, over the last two years and half of the year this year. So hopefully that helps. And maybe Julian wants to add. Yeah, just a simple thought, uh, which is uh, maybe like, like Sesame Street simple, so apologies if it's that simple, uh, which is if you look at the beginning of the year and the end, I think you'll like what you see. In the beginning of the year, we were coming off tremendous strength from last fiscal. Big growth, 9.2% and $9.30 of adjusted EPS. We had uh, significant incremental investments. That's what we call bold and right uh, in phase two. And they were shut down for a period of time, largely the first quarter, because of COVID. As we started turning them back on at the beginning of Q2, we had tremendous sales surge and that margin expansion that uh, everybody and the market seems to be focused on. That's great news. We would be absolute fools now with a better forecast in our hand, a better result in our hand, not to deliver a year that's same or even better than the one that we originally envisioned on the going in basis. We have the cash flow for it, we have the earnings for it, and we have the initiatives for it, uh, and we are only spending money on things that we strongly believe in. So if you go to the end of the year, you should get a result that's better than the one that all of the analysts envision, uh, better than the one that we ourselves envision, uh, and you end up with a significant acceleration of a business that already was accelerating. Um, from that standpoint, it's hard to see the problem here. Yeah, and one last thing I'll point out is you have things like incentive compensation that with the results that we have uh, for the first half of the year and what we're projecting for the full year uh, escalate significantly because the, the results are so good. So the compensation has to get adjusted and that falls uh, in the back half as well. So there are, are you know, things like that that also uh, contribute to the compression, but in our minds, it's all positive. And, and like Julian said, I think you're going to like the outcome at the end of the year. Great, thanks, guys. I'll pass it on. 
Thank you. Our next question is coming from Anthony Lebinski of Sedoti and Company. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, good, good morning again. Thank you for taking the questions and uh, nice to hear that uh, Julian, you'll be staying on for another year and uh, congratulations, Brian, for your uh, pending retirement. So uh, just wanted to follow up, uh, Julian, you said uh, earlier that uh, you'd be looking to, to, for the torrid pace of sales to moderate. Um, would that be mostly in the health and home uh, segment or are you you concerned about moderation in, in other segments of your business as well? Yeah, let, let's uh, make sure we're clear on the on the SOTA moderation. Uh, we just grew 28%, uh, so that probably qualifies for being torrid. I don't know if that's the right word, but it's fast. I can say that. Uh, and it's ahead of, of our expectations as well as the consensus that was in the market. In the case of moderation, um, if you look at the sales that were expected in the market, um, we don't think they're very far off, uh, to be very honest. And that said, we are continuing to see uh, sales coming in faster. Uh, I've mentioned a couple of times that September was extremely strong for us. And October, while it's early days, so far, quite good. Uh, in terms of the uh, stuff that's yet to come, that's where the fog uh, of COVID comes in. And I just can't tell you how that's going to turn out. I can say that what we do see on, on sales looks uh, strong. It uh, just doesn't look 28% uh, strong. Uh, so that's all that we meant by the word moderation. If the market heard anything else, uh, with full respect, that they're incorrect. Uh, and on the topic of extension uh, of my tenure, I want to say thank you. Uh, I'm very proud of what we're doing at Helen of Troy. Uh, we are uh, building the company to last. It has delivered. And the idea of seeing uh, all through the, the transformation, both phase one in the first five years and now phase two in the second five years, uh, that would mark a 10-year run. Uh, and I would be very proud and honored to have the opportunity to take the company through the entire uh, the entire transformation from start to finish. So uh, thank you. Uh, and with regard to Brian, uh, we're, he's a strong go for the full year, and uh, we have tremendous internal capability as well uh, in, in the company in addition to the external search that we mentioned in our prepared remarks. So you're in good hands on the CFO side now as well as uh, on the other side of Brian's retirement the year out. Julian, let me just add a little bit on the compression. I, I think, or, or sorry, the, the moderation of the, the sales in the second half, I think it's less a function of reduced demand and more a function of the comparison to the prior year. We grew 10% in the third quarter of last year, and we grew 15% in the fourth quarter of last year. Uh, beauty grew 23%, housewares grew 15 and health and home grew uh, 10 or 11, 10 and a half. So it, just to be clear, the moderation and growth is less of we see demand weakening and more of it's going to be against a comparison where there was very high growth uh, in the last year. And some of that was even COVID related in the fourth quarter in the health and home business. They, there was early demand for thermometry even in our fourth quarter of last year and some of the other products. So Hopefully that makes sense. It's not a weakening so much in, in the demand, it's more the comparison. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much for, for that. Uh, and uh, just wondering if you guys could uh, perhaps maybe quantify the cost of additional distribution and storage facilities that you talked about in the press release and also, um, you know, as far as the impact of reversing the previous compensation reductions, uh, is, is there a number you can quantify for those as well? Well, on the distribution expense, I, I would say it's, you know, probably not a needle mover at the total company level. It's, it's meaningful spend that we're having to incur to keep up with growth, and, and it's the right thing to do. Um, and it bridges us into the next phase of our distribution footprint that we're in the middle of working on right now. I think you have to understand the, the levels of growth that we've gone through over the last three years to appreciate you know why we're in the position where we need to make these investments and and we've had extensive growth and and it's a good problem to have and, and we're making those investments and doing it in the right way but i wouldn't say you're going to that is a factor for the second half of the year but i don't think it's you know the highest on the list it may be on the in the middle of the list or towards the bottom of the list in terms of influencing uh, that and then in terms of the the compensation uh, reduction anniversary, I think the, the way it played out is that won't be 
so significant of a hurdle uh, to overcome because we acted quickly to restore a lot of that compensation and even we were in situations where we felt like we needed to make hires, certain hires, even though we were in, in the middle of a hiring freeze because strategically and, and to support the business, we felt it was the right thing to do. So I, I think we've minimized the impact of the lower personnel spending in the first uh, part of the year. It will be a factor that we have to consider for next year, but, but it, like I said, I think it end, the way it played out, it ended up being smaller than, than we all thought it would be as we uh, COVID-19 began. Got it. And then uh, I guess the last question for me as far as, the, you know, the, the tax rate, tax rate uh, can you, Brian, uh, recap what you expect for the back half of the year for tax rate and, and then for fiscal 22? Sure. Uh, the back half of the year consistent with uh, where we normally are, you know, I uh, think 10%, 9, 10, 11%, and it'll bounce around uh, quarter to quarter in that range. And then, as I mentioned, there is a change with respect to our Macau entity and the tax regulations there, um, where we're, we will now, going into next fiscal year, be subject to a corporate tax rate there, whereas in the past we, we had a zero uh, tax rate there. And, and that's a massive change, but we were able to structure and do our transfer pricing analysis in a way where the uh, total consolidated uh, effective tax rate impact will only be 1.5 to 2 percentage points going into next year. So you could, you know, you could take where we are, call it 10-ish, maybe a little lower, and then add uh, one and a half to two percentage points to that, and that should be kind of our ongoing effective tax rate. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you, and best of luck. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. In the interest of time, we are asking the additional questioners to please limit themselves to one question and additional questions can be followed up with offline. Our next question is coming from Linda Bolton-Weiser of DA Davidson. Please go ahead. Hi, how are you? And congratulations um, on the quarter and your personal news. Um, can I just ask you about, um, when you talked about the second half of last year and the, the hard comparisons, if you actually look back, it looked like you had margin decline in the fourth fiscal quarter last year, and it was because it looked like the SD&A spending was actually really high. It was up, SD&A was up 33% year over year. So can you remind us what happened in the fourth quarter of last year? Was that marketing spending, or was that compensation expense, or what was that exactly in the fourth quarter of last year? Fourth quarter, of, in, in your right, Linda, I'll also point out that the third quarter of last year, the margins were extremely high. So high margin Q3, lower margin in Q4, you're right. I think if you blend the two together, you know, you get more of a normalized margin uh, for us. And so, yes, there was shifts in spend, uh, less spending in Q3 and more spending in Q4. And we leaned, what we did in Q4 is we saw the results in Q3 and made very conscious decisions in Q4 to spend into the strength that we were seeing. And we likely would have continued that trend going into Q1 and Q2 of this year, but because of COVID, we had to readjust. So hopefully that makes sense to you. We, we saw the result for Q3, and we had a good outlook for the remainder of the year. We made decisions to spend into the business in Q4, and that's why the Q4 margin is lower than normal. But I think if you look at both of those two quarters together, uh, it's a more normalized margin. Okay, thanks, I'll leave it there, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, our next question is coming from Steve Murata of CL King. Please go ahead. Good morning, Julian and Brian. In the interest of time, I'll ask one very quick question. As it pertains, I believe, Julian, you mentioned the share or purchase as one potential outcome for uh, capital use. Can you talk a little bit about uh, if that has been officially suspended during COVID, if it has been unsuspended, if it was never suspended, and what the balance of that share or purchase plan might be. Yeah, yeah, good, thanks. And hi, Steve, and thank, thanks for asking that. Um, in the early days of COVID, we didn't feel comfortable on the topic of share repurchase, even though the stock was greatly depressed along with the rest of the entire uh, securities market. There was just too much uncertainty, and we didn't know uh, what was to come. Uh, we also couldn't give guidance. 
uh, at that time and, and not even the, the pretty significant set of breadcrumbs that we've put out today. Uh, in uh, the second, uh, the first quarterly report, the one we gave in July, um, we, we gave much more news about what we were seeing in terms of trends uh, and signals about where we were on the business. But nonetheless, as you can tell from today's announcement, uh, did not buy back stock. Um, in terms of where we are now, uh, without telegraphing in any way, I, I can simply say that we have put out a pretty strong result in the first half, and we've given you as much visibility as we can for the second half. So even in the absence of guidance, uh, were we to make the decision to buy back stock, we would feel very comfortable doing so, and the market is given a keen understanding of where we stand um, past, present, and our visibility for the future. And with regard to the capital allocation, uh, you see our balance sheet and also our cash flow. I, I'd like to remind uh, everyone here that we're entering the strongest cash flow part of the year, which traditionally is the back half. So that's likely uh, to be an accelerant uh, for us from a balance sheet standpoint. You see our debt ratios as well. Our net debt ratio that we just reported um, is half a turn, I believe, and Brian to please confirm. Uh, and we're about to generate a lot more cash, assuming the second half of the year uh, goes well. And so even with the investments that we're making, which I again remind, these were the original investments that we planned at the beginning of the year. They just got lumpy, meaning less in the first half, more in the second half. I just can't emphasize it enough. Um, it, we believe that the full visibility is there, and were we to buy back stock, we would do so with, uh, without concern. Helpful. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to turn the floor back over to Mr. Minenberg for closing comments. Yeah, well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Um, it was simply an outstanding quarter, uh, and not just an outstanding quarter, but an outstanding first half. We like very much where we stand. Uh, we believe we're making all the right choices on what to do going forward. Uh, that said, there is uncertainty out there, and I hope we've communicated it responsibly today. Uh, we look forward to speaking to many of you in the coming days and weeks and updating you on our progress. Our next report will be of our results for the third quarter, and that will come on the traditional timing in January. So with that, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your participation. This concludes today's event. You may disconnect your lines or log off the webcast at this time, and have a wonderful day.